This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 136, the seventh part of the Grand Canyon Rim to Rim series. I recently published my book, Grand Canyon Rim to Rim History, which includes many newly discovered stories that I had not previously included in this podcast. In this episode, I will cover the story of a forgotten man, Thomas Curitan of Williams, Arizona, who shared the love of rim-to-rim hiking with a generation of youth in the 1920s. Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon. Make sure you get my book, Grand Canyon Rim-to-Rim History, on Amazon in paperback, hardback, Audible, and Kindle. 260 pages packed with more than 400 historic photos to enhance your next run in the canyon. Mm-hmm. Run, come see what this river has done. Carve the walls of Grand Canyon with the colors of the rising sun. Thomas Curitan of Williams, Arizona was a significant Grand Canyon rim to rim contributor. Over several years in the 1920s, he guided about 50 youth across the canyon and back, teaching them minimalist camping skills and how to love the canyon while hiking on the developing inner Grand Canyon trails. His pioneer rim-to-rim efforts inspired and launched hikes involving thousands of Boy Scouts to hike rim-to-rim in the decades to come. Fascinating and very detailed accounts of their canyon adventures have been recently discovered and are preserved in this episode. Curitan was also the grandfather of future rim-to-rim record holder, Alan Curitan, who held the fastest known rim-to-rim times for 38 years. What led Thomas Curitan to make such an impact on the youth of Williams and to introduce them and the citizens of Williams to the joy of crossing the Grand Canyon rim to rim. Curitan was originally from Missouri. He started teaching in 1894 in a country school near Niels, Missouri, and then moved to Montana where he taught for several years. Furthering his education, he moved to Lawrence, Kansas, and received a law degree at the University of Kansas. While attending, he married Nellie King, of his home state of Missouri. She also attended Kansas, where she received a master's degree in Latin. Both were highly educated and natural leaders. In 1906, they moved to Williams, Arizona, where Curitan became the superintendent of schools. He was given the title or nickname of Professor, or Prof for short. Teaching conditions were challenging in the small city, with about 1,000 residents. The school, grades 1 through 8, were crowded with up to 200 children, 50 per room, in the four-room school where Curitan was both the principal and teacher of multiple grades. After two years, in 1908, Curitan resigned his job in Williams and went back to school and attended Harvard University where he earned a Master's of Arts degree. In 1911, Curitan returned to Williams to lead and teach again. He was asked why he returned to Williams. Well, for one thing, I was interested to see how that lot of trees had grown that we planted when I was here before. The city of Williams had been mostly devoid of trees, and Curitan had started a multi-decade effort to import and plant trees across the city. As principal, Curitan was not timid about doing unusual things to spark the interest of his students. As the snow started to fall, he constructed a toboggan slide 80 feet long in the schoolyard for 8th and 9th grade boys. It was so popular that lanterns were put up along the slide the first night, allowing them to slide until a late hour. Boys would get to school early and slide until the school bell sounded. It was reported that the slide, quote, was a great help to the progress and discipline of the school as to keep the children busy and contented. Attendance at the school dramatically increased. Curitan soon introduced an athletic club at the school. 
He was a strong advocate of sports, especially basketball. While attending the University of Kansas, he had become acquainted with its physical education director, Dr. James Naismith, who invented the sport of basketball in 1891. Early 1912, as the school children were on winter break, the Williams School building burned down. One cool day in January 1912, Williams was awakened at 6 a.m. by the loud pealing of bells and a shrill blowing of whistles. The leaping flames to the south with telegraphic swiftness announced to the remotest sections of town that the schoolhouse was on fire and that no possible force within reach could save it. The peal of the old school bell is hushed, and its tongue choked with fire and ashes beneath a debris of fallen walls. The suspected cause was sparks from a chimney fire. Pipes were frozen, making it impossible to save the building. Curitan worked hard to save the school year. What little furniture that could be saved was moved into the Methodist and Catholic churches and the upstairs of the opera house to continue classes. Thanks to his lobbying efforts, within a month of its burning, a larger school was planned to be built. The new school was complete in only eight months, ready for the next school year. The first high school in Williams was also established, with only a few students, but it would grow to 47 in 1921. Curitan started to purchase acres of land in Williams, becoming one of the largest property owners in the town. He branched out into a business building bungalows and cottages around town and sold alfalfa hay to local farmers and also established a poultry ranch selling eggs and chickens. Curitan was deeply involved with his students even after school hours. In 1919, he had arranged a basketball game between the high school team in Williams against the team in Winslow, Arizona. The boys were allowed to travel to the game without adult supervision. The Williams team won convincingly but behaved poorly during the game. A very unpleasant incident occurred during the game compelling the officers to penalize the visitors for use of profane language, which was objected by some of the spectators. Curitan wrote a long letter of apology to the Winslow schools. Never again will I allow schoolboys to go alone even though our games go far behind financially. I have had the boys in my office a long period today, and they all regret the conduct and promise to be gentlemen in the future. In July 1921, Curitan started taking youth on campouts which would eventually lead him to the Grand Canyon. He took Boy Scouts camping out in the forest at Sycamore Canyon, about 17 miles from Williams. The attraction was a swimming hole with cliffs to jump off. Curitan always camped with a minimalist approach, sleeping out in the open with just blankets. A favorite activity during the day was chipmunk races. Someone would spy a chipmunk, and off they would all race through the woods till someone ran him up a tree. When he jumped, the lucky fellow catching him was the winner. They would then set him free, the excited chipmunk no doubt wondering what all the hullabaloo was about, but thankful for his skin. In 1923, the respect that students had for Prof. Curitan was on display when the seniors observed Ditch Day and kidnapped Curitan to join them on an outing to view cliff dwellings near Flagstaff. Prof felt proud of the students, who did not idly waste their time, but showed such keen interest in the formations, art, and history of the ancient landmark that he was called upon to do as much lecturing as any school class demanded. During the summer of 1924, Together with Clarence Ratcliffe, a photographer, he made a very rugged five-day hike down Sycamore Canyon, the second-largest canyon in Arizona, head-to-mouth about 40 miles in the heat of August when water was scarce. These men are possessed of what might be termed a peculiar bent, in that they are the only ones known to have been similarly inflicted for many, many years. Curitan became hooked on doing tough, long-distance hikes. Grand Canyon, 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 Gr
Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. Kirtan, age 48, led his first Grand Canyon rim-to-rim hike during the week of August 17, 1924, to take four young men from Williams with him. Radcliffe, the photographer, also went along. The hike was ambitious, four days total, camping at the bottom each way. They made stops to enjoy the scenery and also for swims in the Colorado River. The ascent to the North Rim follows the bed of Bright Angel Creek for four miles and this creek is crossed 60 times in that distance. At first the party took off their shoes before crossing, but later they saw the impossibility of keeping this up at each ford and plunged in full shod. The stream is about 18 inches deep and very swift. They carried very little food, mostly bread and bacon, and got quite hungry. The trip was enjoyed as keenly by Prof and by the boys. Prof looked ten years younger after the fine outing. In 1925, Curitan again brought a youth group to the Grand Canyon to experience a double crossing and to camp in rugged open-air conditions. The group that started down Bright Angel Trail on June 14, 1925, consisted of seven young women, three ladies, and three men. The large group traveled surprisingly light. Each member carried a knapsack with only one blanket, a tin plate, a spoon, a canteen, personal items, and enough food for ten days. They planned to camp in the open. The ladies' pack weighed 10 to 15 pounds, and the men carried 30 to 35 pounds. They would cook in tin buckets and frying pans that the men carried. On the first day, they descended 3,000 feet and 7 miles, passing through Indian Garden, now known as Havasupai Gardens. They continued for a couple miles and stopped on the Tonto Trail. After supper, we spread our blankets in the sand and gravel for our first night. The girls sang us to sleep. Sing around the campfire, meet the moon above. Sing while he loves, sing while he loves, work, help, love. The next morning, after a breakfast of cream of wheat, bacon, bread, and prunes, they continued east to tip off. They hiked down the nearly complete new South Kaibab Trail, and crossed over the swinging suspension bridge which gave them a thrill. Their second camp was above Phantom Ranch before the box. The temperature was fierce. We all took a plunge in Bright Angel Creek. Continuing up Bright Angel Canyon the next morning, they had to wade across the creek 37 times in two miles. The water was cold and swift in places, two feet deep with round rolling slick boulders on the bottom but each member of the party was equal to the task and came through in good shape. They camped near Ribbon Falls, where they played the next morning. The following night, they camped under some oak trees along Bright Angel Creek, above the confluence with Roaring Springs Creek. The next day, they made the huge climb up toward the North Rim on the old Bright Angel Trail with its steep zigzags. The North Kaibab Trail up Roaring Spring Canyon was in early construction, but not ready for use. We reached Trough Springs, a distance of three miles, had lunch of hardtack, cheese, and raisins, then completed the climb to the North Rim. They continued their journey along the rim for three miles, reaching Woolley's cabin and the spring there. It was cold on the rim and looked like it would rain. Some cowboys there loaned the group some tents, but it was so cold that by 3 a.m., Most of them were huddled around a large campfire, wrapped in their blankets, trying to keep warm. They improved their sleeping conditions the next day and spent three nights camping on the North Rim. Their favorite time was in the evenings. The campfire songs and stories were a scream. Among the activities was a successful snipe hunt. The snipe hunt prank, duping outdoor rookies to hunt for an imaginary creature with an empty bag, began as early as the 1840s. You need a bag so you can put on the snipe's trail so it runs into your bag, so you can catch it, obviously. Now you need a snipe wacky stick. What you're going to do is you are going to take your snipe wacky stick, and once you catch it in the bag, you're going to whack it. Make sense? 
Kirtan also taught the group to sing the King of the Cannibal Islands song. The journey back across the canyon went well, and they successfully reached the south rim where their cars were waiting for them. The nine days trip camping in the open will long be remembered by every member of the party. Word of Curitan's Grand Canyon expedition spread throughout Arizona. Prof is gaining fame rapidly for his fine ability as a hike master and for the wonderful localities he picks as his destinations. On August 23, 1925, Curitan led his third Grand Canyon expedition on a double crossing, a group of two men and eleven boys. It was extremely hot. They crossed the river on the swinging suspension bridge and camped at the confluence of Bright Angel Creek and the Colorado River on a sandy beach which they called Little Sahara. There they cooled off swimming. They spent the evening singing songs as Curitan played tunes on his harmonica. In the morning, after another plunge in the Colorado River, they were on their way up Bright Angel Creek by 7 a.m. They counted 37 crossings before reaching Ribbon Falls, where they camped, finding shelter from a storm in overhanging cliffs and caves. The next day, they reached the North Rim via the old Bright Angel Trail, and camped near Woolly Cabin. While on the rim, they went exploring, visiting Bright Angel Point and Wiley Way Camp, the auto camp, and counting deer in the forest. On their return journey the next day, they made good time and reached the river by early afternoon. They spent the day in throwing contests and blanket tossing. Before noon the next day, they arrived at the top of the south rim and gave a huge ovation and cheers to Curitan showing their appreciation for the wonderful trip. There were no sad incidents except a few blisters. On August 22, 1926, Curitan's fourth expedition included eight boys, including his 13-year-old son Carl. This time they descended the new South Kaibab Trail, which had opened the previous summer. They camped on the beach of the Colorado River and the next day ate lunch at Ribbon Falls and enjoyed a shower bath in its spray. At Cottonwood Flats, with great excitement, they killed a large rattlesnake, took its rattler, and reached the North Rim by dusk. At Bright Angel Point, their food was purchased at Wiley Way Camp, which was much better than what they had in their backpacks. It was quite cold that night, but they stayed comfortably warm in the pine needles and kept a big campfire blazing throughout the night. One of the pine needle beds caught fire from sparks about midnight, furnishing yet another variety of thrill. After extinguishing the blaze, the crowd wrapped themselves in their blankets and lay as close as possible to the fire until dawn. They had originally planned to camp for two nights on the rim, but because of the cold and wind, headed back across the canyon on the next day and caught many large rainbow trout in the creek along the way. They had to move their camp for the next night after being driven out by scorpions. The journey enlivened by almost constant singing, the favorite selections being A Long Long Trail and The King of the Cannibal Islands. There's a long, long trail The boys found it very interesting to listen to various echoes along the trail and compare the number discernible at different points. From July 8th to the 15th, 1928, Curitan, along with his son Carl, led his fifth Grand Canyon double crossing expedition, this time with both boys and girls, with a total of 10 in the group. One girl wrote a long, detailed trip report that ended in a Canada newspaper. Kirtan led them down South Kaibab Trail playing Marching Through Georgia on his harmonica. 
At the river, the boys crossed over the unfinished black bridge, while the girls crossed on the swinging suspension bridge, which was still in place below the black bridge. The group camped for the night on the Little Sahara Beach. We all went wading, and the boys later in the evening went swimming. After supper, oatmeal, raisins, prunes, coffee, and bread, we played in the soft silver sands for a while. Then, since we were all tired, we unrolled our blankets and tried to sleep. A hot breeze blew sand in our faces all night. None of us were used to sleeping on the hard ground, so I'm afraid none of us got much sleep that night. Their stroll through Phantom Ranch was amazing. There was a lovely orchard here, and we all gazed hungrily at the peaches and apples hanging on the trees. Carl and Leslie dropped behind, and from the smiles on their faces when they again joined us, we knew that the peaches were good. Prof played some more tunes as we continued our march. They continued up through the box and reached Ribbon Falls in the late afternoon, where they stashed some food for the return trip in the cliffs near the falls. There was a cave under the falls, and we all waded back into it. We got very wet passing under the falling water, but we didn't mind that. They camped under Roaring Springs, where there was a stove and the remains of a construction camp. That evening, we told ghost stories after our blankets were spread out and supper was over. It rained a little that night, but didn't bother us. A deer came into the camp and woke us up. On the hard climb up North Kaibab Trail, still under construction in Roaring Springs Canyon, one girl was so exhausted that the boys carried her up quite a distance. At the North Rim, they resupplied their food at the nearly complete new Grand Canyon Lodge. Because Curitan knew the manager, they were allowed to look around the hotel and, quote, almost bought out the soda fountain. After fully supplied, they headed back down the trail, camped again at Roaring Springs, and the boys went fishing. At about noon the next day, they had company at their camp. A guide came down to our camp. There were just two women in his party, two ladies from Boston, and neither had ever been on a mule before, so you can imagine how sore and stiff they were. They had on dresses and little silk hats. Their faces were burned fiery red, and they were exhausted and uncomfortable. The guide helped them from their mules to the cool shade under the trees. We talked to them, and after they had eaten their lunch, which the guide carried on his saddle, they went on down to the river. That evening at Roaring Springs, they ate fish and played games. We found some boards and fixed up a seesaw on a rock and took turns bouncing up and down. Then we pitched half dollars into holes in the ground. We played until we were all tired. We told ghost stories that night, then went to sleep. The next day they reached Ribbon Falls, where they retrieved their stash of food. We got into a water fight. The rest of the gang was plenty wet, too. They went back to work hiking, ate supper at Phantom Ranch, and then camped at the Colorado River. The boys built a big fire on the sand, and we had a time telling stories. Then we went to sleep thinking of the hard climb the next day. In the morning, they climbed up to tip off and then took the Tonto Trail toward Indian Garden. We camped at Burrow Springs, where Prof told us we could cook anything we wanted. Cooked fruit, millions of hotcakes, and something of nearly everything we had. Then we ate. We marched on to Indian Garden in the late afternoon. There were lots of fruit on the trees here, and we ate plenty of green and ripe ones, too, peaches and apples. They got up at 3 a.m. to get ready for the last climb. We went slowly and rested often, and gradually drew nearer to the top. We met many people coming down the trail, afoot, and by mule back. They reached the top and ate everything in their packs. This was the last known youth double crossing that Curitan led. Over the years, he brought nearly 50 young people rim to rim and back. As Curitan reached his mid-fifties, 
He would take his sons and grandsons on several backcountry outings exploring remote canyons coming down from the North Rim. He retired from teaching at the age of 65 and fished a lot at Lake Mead and spent occasional winters in California. In 1953, Curitan experienced a stroke. Improvement was made over the months, but he decreased his activity. In 1955, he suffered a more serious stroke and moved into a care facility in Phoenix until his death in 1957. When he died, he had eight grandchildren. Prof. Thomas Curitan made sure that much of the land that he owned in Williams was donated to the city designated for recreation. In 1960, the city's swimming pool was built on his former land. In 1986, 6.6 .6 acres of Curitan Park was set aside for a new pool, tennis courts, volleyball court, and exercise stations. Few remember Prof. Curitan and his enormous contributions toward rim-to-rim -to -rim hiking. Hopefully, this episode will solidify his impact in the Grand Canyon rim-to-rim -rim history. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>